Uh, I'll be talking about how over the last quarter of a millennium, fossil fuels have advanced human and environmental well-being. It did this by making us less dependent on nature's bounty for food, fuel, energy, and materials. Before fossil fuels came on the scene, we got everything from nature's current account. Food, of course, came from the sun, etc., etc. And uh, the f for the fuel, we used timber and uh, uh, whatever we found on the ground. And same thing for energy. And for materials, we again used timber and vegetable matter, etc. For fiber, we used uh, uh, cotton uh, uh, or, or sheep or what, uh, you name it. But everything essentially came from nature one way or the other. And because of that, we were subject to nature's whims. If we had a bad harvest, humanity would suffer. And it wouldn't be just humanity that would suffer, it would also be the, and, uh, the beasts and the animals and, um, and, 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 the, uh, and the ecosystem that would also suffer. What fossil fuels al allowed us to do was to substitute these nature-based products with not using nature's current account, but using what nature had put away in its own battery. That's what fossil fuels are, they're nature's battery. And it has allowed us to break free from nature's whims. And because of that, and I'll go through it, I'll show you how we no longer uh, have to starve when we have a, a bad harvest. Crop failures are now almost a thing of the past. If crop failures happen, it's not because of anything other than the fact that there's conflict going on or there's really poor governance. Um, And at the same time, our well-being has improved, and carbon dioxide levels have never been at, 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 the, at, at a higher level. That's human emissions of carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so a couple of days ago, I googled uh, three warmest years, and what I got was uh, that the three warmest years were 2014, 2015 and 2016, in ascending order. At least this is what I got from Google. Let's assume that the surface data record on which this is based is good, accurate, etc. We don't want to get into that. That's a different, that's a different matter. And this makes perfect sense if you are, quote unquote, a warmest, because CO2 levels are also at the highest levels. Now, We are also told that as CO2 goes up and temperatures go up, life will become miserable for all of us. We will have famines, crops will fail, and uh, increasing numbers will die from various diseases. Extreme weather events will, uh, will devastate us. Life expectancies would drop. We would run out of water. Incomes would drop. Poverty would increase and the rest of nature would suffer, and so on. In other words, we should expect human and environmental levels of uh, well-being to be at its lowest levels. At least it should be declining. In a, and we should be actually living the worst of times. But is that the case? Let's look at the historical record. OK, this is, I started this uh, curve at AD1. If we had gone further back, I'd just have to extend those lines all the way back. What I have here are three indicators of human well-being, which is essentially uh, GDP per capita, which is that red line. Whoops. Let's go back. Is there a pointer on this? I guess not. OK. Uh, GDP per capita is a red line, then the blue uh, the green line is population, and life expectancy is a blue line. Life expectancy is probably the single best indicator of human well-being. And GDP per capita is perhaps the best indicator of material well-being. 
On this curve, I've also plotted carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is that black line, starts at zero, essentially hugs zero until about 250 years ago. Now, we see that essentially we have a, we have a series of hockey sticks. And, they were, uh, and the hockey sticks started turning up uh, around 1750 or thereabouts. Now we can see this a little bit uh, better. Uh, we can see what was happening a little better if we take a look at just the last 250, 260 years. We see, first of all, that initially there was some improvement in, uh, in, popula and, and in the population level and also some improvement in the, a little bit of improvement in the life expectancy. But by and large, we were, uh, uh, the real improvements came once the Industrial Revolution kicked in. So, and it wasn't that the Industrial Revolution started this. Things were already improving because over time, humanity had, had, had learned a lot of things. We had developed tools, we had, uh, we had developed trade. We, uh, we figured out how to na navigate the seas, we developed irrigation, we figured out that you needed storage bins for food and so on. And because of that, we were slowly increasing the l uh, amount of food that was available to us, to us, and we were also making us a lot more resilient in case there was uh, a, a famine or a flood or what have you that destroyed the crops. So, but initially the surplus went to increasing the population and a little bit to increasing life expectancy. And there wasn't a whole lot of improvement in the level of, uh, uh, and of material well-being. So the person who was uh, alive in the 1700s, his material well-being wasn't a whole lot different from what it would have been before the, before the plague in the 1300s. Uh, but but he was a little bit healthier, and, he, uh, uh, and uh, there were a few more people around. So it, it's not surprising that, in, in the words of Hobbes, the life of man was solitary, poor, uh, uh, nasty, brutish, and short. This started to change with the Industrial Revolution. Whoops. Okay, and we can see that with the Industrial Revolution, around 1700, uh, around 1700 things were improving. The first to improve uh, was the Netherlands. After the Netherlands started, uh, Netherlands improvement was ba based not really on uh, uh, fossil fuels, but was based upon peat, which is kind of not quite a fossil fuel, but it is not from nature's current account either. So it's an in-between fuel. So after the Netherlands, um, Britain came along and they had their industrial revolution. And that industrial revolution spread ac across the continent and to its Eng English-speaking colonies. And by around 1800, 1850, uh, that had started moving on. And it wasn't until the 19, late 1900s that uh, Asia started picking up, and uh, and now Africa seems to have joined them, except in a couple of spots like southern Sudan, etc. Now this tells us that what I have here is I've plotted the growth rates for population uh, prosperity, which is GDP per capita, life expectancy, and CO2 emissions. It tells us what the growth rates were between, for the first millennium, for the, from AD 1000 to 1750, and then since 1750. We can see that there's very little progress in the, in the uh, human enterprise until around 1750. This essentially uh, uh, is affirming what I was saying. But we can see that 
until around 1750, there was virtually no growth in uh, human emissions of carbon dioxide. And it was only after it picked up that everything else went up. And, uh, we, and, and one of the things that I've said is that we were get, uh, get a living longer. The important thing, one of the things that automatically comes up when you say that we are all living longer is, but are we living healthier? And the answer to that is, yes, we are living healthier. And the way we know that is that there is, we take a look at life expectancy, and we also look at something called health-adjusted life expectancy, HAIL. It is supposed to adjust life expectancy downward for health-related problems that people have. Okay? So, HAIL can never exceed life expectancy. What this tells us is that in the year 2015, our health-adjusted life expectancy exceeded life expectancy, what it, total life ex expectancy unadjusted in the year 1950. And, and I would say at least until 1960, 1970. Take a look at China, for example. Its life expectancy in 1950 was 41. Today it is at, uh, its hail is 68.5. Its life expectancy is in the 70, 70s. And so on. That's true for every place un under the sun. I think I did this analysis and I think I compared it for each country and it was true for every country, but uh, I think accepting none. So we are healthier, uh, we, are, we live longer and we are healthier. At the same time, as we saw, and we, we were getting wealthier and as we are getting wealthier, Poverty is dropping. In 1820, 84% of the population would be considered to be living below what's quote unquote absolute poverty. That's $1 per day based upon $1985. How that was selected was actually an accident, but that's neither here nor there. But today, we are, uh, we are below 10% when it comes to, when, when it comes to uh, absolute, uh, absolute uh, poverty. We, we see that as time has gone on, fewer and fewer people are, are going, hung, uh, going uh, hungry. And again, we see that all this co uh, co is inversely correlated with the amount of carbon dioxide. And uh, we see that when we look at virtually any measure of human well-being, we see that things are improving even as carbon dioxide goes up. And there's a, Fewer people are dying from extreme events, extreme weather events. Malaria deaths are down. And what's more, the planet is also greening. Now, this shows something called the leaf index, uh, leaf area index. It shows that we are leafier. 70% of that is supposed to be, uh, it has been attributed to carbon dioxide, 9% to nitrogen deposition, 8% to climate change. Every, each one of these is related to fossil fuel emissions or fossil fuel related activities. And not only is, are we getting greener, we are also getting more productive. In fact, according to the uh, IPCC, there's a line that says that we are 5% we are more productive today than we were in the 17, late 1700s. Now, so when we look at the data, uh, how do we conclude that CO2 must be reduced? Is it because global pop, uh, population is becoming wealthier, that poverty is falling? Perhaps fewer people are going hungry. Uh, we don't like the fact that fewer people go hungry or malnutrition is drop, dropping. We can't handle the fact that people are healthier, living longer, etc. There's absolutely no empirical basis to say, based upon what we know today. It's the warmest we've been, yet things are not, uh, things are not panning out like we were told they would with warming. So instead of be, uh, living in the worst of times, we are actually living in the best of times. And carbon dioxide uh, and fossil fuels are a good part of that. 
and all the activities associated with fossil fuels, which give out carbon dioxide emissions, make the earth more productive, etc. Okay, I guess I won't get, I don't have time. One more minute. Okay, thank you. Okay.